Hi, welcome to the very first episode of Talking Tax with Alex. I'm shooting these series of videos to talk about nerdy tax topics that maybe you don't get to talk about with your CPA or you're too afraid to talk about with your CPA or maybe you're just interested in weird stuff like I am and you want to know about the tax law. Um, you know, I'm sure there's dozens of us that are interested in this and um, yeah, so here we go. Uh, in this very first episode, we're going to talk about something that I come up with, or I come across a lot in my practice. It's uh, regarding the passive activity losses, passive activity loss rules, and what it takes to be a real estate professional. So, a lot of a lot of my clients and a lot of investors out there are investing in real estate, and they think it's a great deal. They're told that they can deduct all the losses, and you know it's a really good tax maneuver. And most of the time, it is. But there's tax laws underneath that most normal people or you know non-practicing CPAs are people that are not really well versed in the tax law are not considering and so we're going to discuss those and we're going to use a real life court case to kind of piece out all the issues and talk about what it takes to get a deduction under the past passive activity loss rules and to yield some tax results for yourself um, just as a disclosure disclaimer you know I none of this is legal advice or um, actual advice for your tax situation, please consult your own tax advisor. Uh, you can't use my video to support your your position in front of the IRS or anything. This is purely for entertainment uh, for, for the dozens of us that, that care about tax issues like this. And if you really want to get in contact with me, I have my email at the bottom of the slide, talkingtaxwithalex at gmail.com. So, in this video, the agenda is we're going to look at this court case. It's Christian Sezanov at Ux against the commissioner, which is the, always the IRS. We're going to evaluate the facts of the court case, uh, what the issues are, the ruling, and the closing thoughts. So, yeah, on the agenda, there's uh, a little bit of spoilers here. You know, uh, the IRS prevailed in this court case, but we're going to explore why. And I think this is a really good court case to examine these issues and to talk, uh, think about what underlying uh, tax law and issues are in this this um, area of being a real estate professional. So, as I said, this court case, this is the site and this is what we're talking about. So all images, information, and everything I got was out of this court case. The facts. So. In this court case, taxpayers were husband and wife, and the tax years were the 2013 and 14 tax year. They own and operated an HVAC business in Ohio. Um, the taxpayer, the husband, um, stated that this was his full-time job. The spouse did not have a stated full-time job. This will be important later. And they did not elect the, an IRC 469C7A aggregate election to aggregate their, aggregate their activities. That'll be important later. Um, other facts, they purchased two rental properties. So remember they lived in Ohio and they purchased two rental properties in Florida. And property number one, they purchased and leased um, to the old tenant and then they the old tenant left and subsequently they leased it out to a new tenant on a one year lease term. The second property was a property they purchased that was a condominium and it was and they were renting it out month to month because it had access to a boat slip. And so it was a property that was more desirable for vacation, long-term vacation um, types versus what appeared to be more the first property which was uh, probably a single family living situation or so, something like that. The services performed and the expenses claimed on the tax were on the tax returns in question were cleaning and furnishing and getting the 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 units ready for rental um, filing a lawsuit to claim right to the boat slip to make sure that they had that the um, the second property had access to the boat slip and then advertising emailing and doing normal renter renter stuff to get people to rent your properties so these were the services um, performed and some of the expenses that they claimed and the records that they kept um, on on the record in the court case was that they actually kept no contemporaneous records and they created a time log of estimates of the time they spent doing the the services provided just said before and all of these losses were recorded on schedule e so 
the record was the tax return itself, and they didn't actually have anything, you know, written during the time, during the years in question. So um, keep this in mind, and the record keeping I, I thought was very interesting because there's no contemporaneous records. However, they were allowed to create an estimated tax log, and this slide, this is a snapshot of what was in the court records. So you can see uh, somebody typed this out in a very archaic word processing program. They didn't even line up the years. It's a little hard to read, but you stare at this long enough, and you can kind of get the gist of what they're getting at. Um, Mrs. Sezanov and Mr. Sezanov, uh, the two years in question, how much time they spent on each property, the Marina Bay property and the Ray Bell property. Um, I think the Marina Bay property is the property with the, with the boat slip. Um, I would have to go double check the court case for that, but for our analysis of the facts, that fact doesn't matter. However, I just want to point out Here's uh, the court accepting the taxpayer's estimates of what they did on what services. This is a recreation of the taxpayer's estimate. So you notice that the taxpayer didn't write down what time went to what service. They just said total time. They said, all right, I, uh, Mrs. Sesenov spent 254 hours in 2013 on the Marina Ray Brock. Marina Bay property, but there was no designation of was this uh, cleaning and furnishing, was this emailing and advertising. We don't know. They don't know. The court don't, doesn't know. And this is what was submitted into the court. So the issues at hand and the issues that the taxpayers were, were arguing for were are these deductions allowed in 2013 and 2014? And are the taxpayers real estate professionals as defined by the codes 469C7? So are the deductions allowed? So what kind of deductions are allowed for rental properties? So typically rental properties are allowed um, ordinary necessary business deductions, which are section 162 deductions and those deductions are allowable for all businesses. So any business that has a deduction that is used or incurred in the ordinary and necessary course of business is allowable. But what's at the issue here? The issue is whether these are passive activity losses and what kind of records you need to substantiate them. So passive activity losses are different than what I just said, ordinary business losses. They're kind of a subset of it, where, whereby there's a special set of rules that if you, if you have a passive activity, you're only allowed to offset that passive activity loss against passive activity income. What does passive activity mean? And what is a spousal loophole? Well, the passive activity is dictated by your material participation, which is why it's a capital, capitalized term here. Material participation, there's several tests that um, the IRS prescribes. I think there's about seven. But the most common test is the 500 hour test. So the 500, if you spent 500 hours in any given activity, it's considered material participation. The spousal loophole is that you could have your spouse participate in some of that 500 hours and it counts towards both of you. So for example, uh, if taxpayer spent 300 hours, spouse spent 250 hours, the law isn't gonna examine each of them and say, well, uh, taxpayer only spent 300 hours, not material participation, spouse only, participate 250 hours, not material participation. The law is actually going to look for the, the loophole, the spousal loophole is for real, real property or rental property only, but it looks at the total combined uh, participation of each spouse. So actually for rental property only, the taxpayer and the spouse can combine their total hours and try to meet the 500 hour requirement. And what is the, the IRC 469C7A aggregation election. So that is a special sub-election that you can make that if you have multiple rental properties, you can elect to treat multiple rental properties as one activity to then measure against your material participation. This is important because if you don't make this election, each rental property you have, let's say you have three rental properties, each rental property you have needs to meet the 500 hour test separately. And you can see how this is starting to get really crazy because if you have four or five rental properties, you're all of a sudden going to need to meet 500 hours. So that's 2000, maybe 2500 hours of time 
per uh, total in the year, you have to substantiate that. So by making this election, this 469C7A election, you can say, well, I have five rental properties, but they're really all one, ac one activity. So I can do, so we can measure 500 hours against that one activity, even though you have four rental properties. That's why it's important. And so um, that was another issue in this case. Um, taxpayers did not make this election, so they had two rental properties and each property then needed to meet the 500 hour material participation, material participation threshold. The other issue, the other issue at hand and related to this material participation and passive activity, passive activity laws, losses um, have their own kind of subset of rules. And one of those subset of rules is real estate professionals. So real estate professionals have to jump through their own set of hurdles first so that their activity can be defined as material participation. So you have to be a real estate professional first and then you can get measured through material participation. And when we look at the real estate, and you're probably already reading the real estate professionals um, um, bullets and going, well, 750 hours, that kind of contradicts what you just said, Alex, about the 500 hours. We'll get there in a second. So to be a real estate professional per code 469C7, you need to spend over a ha more than one half of your personal services in the year need to be in the trader business of real property. What does that mean? So if I'm a CPA and I work 2000 hours as a CPA working at a firm, I would need to spend a thousand and one hours doing real property um, services to qualify in the first, this is for the first test. This is a two prong test. Um, so I would need to spend a thousand and one hours at least doing real property. So you can see all of a sudden now the burden of proof is I need to prove to the IRS that I spent 3000 hours a year working again, not impossible, but kind of improbable. You know, I'm not, I'm not discrediting that people can't work. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm not discrediting people can't work 3000 hours a year, but you know, that gets pretty, that's pretty out, out there and it's a little bit difficult and you have to prove it. Right? So this is important because it's one half of your, of your services. And remember when we talked about taxpayers in this issue, the husband, the husband taxpayer worked as an HVAC or worked in an HVAC business, wholesale business. So he would be in the same situation I would be as a CPA where you would need to prove out, um, you need to prove out that you worked over a thousand one hours, but the wife, if she didn't claim to work, the wife would need to only prove out that she worked more than one half of her personal service and she didn't work one half of zero, zero, right? So that's where the second le level or the second level of this test, the 750 hour service rule test comes in. So the 750 hour test is basically the second level of the test where it says you have to spend at least 750 hours a year um, doing real, real, uh, real property work to qualify as a real estate professional. So this is what qualifies the spouse. If the spouse who didn't have another job spent at least 750 hours doing real, um, real property work and trader business work, then she would qualify as a real estate professional. And unlike the material participation where we could aggregate that spousal loophole, where we can aggregate the, for the 500 hours taxpayer and spouse, this real estate professional um, rule does not allow you to aggregate. So we have to measure each spouse separately. So taxpayer, we need to prove over a thousand and one hours. Spouse, the wife, we need to prove um, 750 hours. We couldn't take spouse at 500 hours and taxpayer at um, 300 hours and combine them and say, yeah, this is 800 hours. They, they, they qualify and they're real estate professionals. So how, how does this interplay? So once you qualify as a real estate professional, <clears throat> it almost seems intuitive that you are going to qualify for material participation. So qualifying as a real estate professional is kind of like the, if you jump this first hurdle, you're more likely than not going to be a material participation in, um, in the activity. One more side note is for actual real estate professionals, like if you're a broker or a real estate developer and you do this for a living and you work at a firm, let's say a, a you know, brokerage or a, a development firm and you spend your 2000 hours there, right? 
you would only need to meet the 750 hour service test for the rental property because you already spend more than one half of your personal services in the real prop, uh, real property trader business. So you see how that, that rules one and two kind of interplay a little bit. Um, so if you already work in the real property um, world, then you just need to have prove 750 hours of service in your rental properties. So the ruling for our taxpayers here, the taxpayers were not allowed deduct, they were, the deductions were allowed, but they were limited as passive losses. And so this means that they're disallowed in the current years and they're carried forward into, the, into future years and they'll be allowed to offset future passive income. So I'm not gonna go into what future, what passive income is yet or in this, the purpose, and that's not the purpose of this video. Maybe I'll shoot another one and we can discuss that topic a little further. But the point of this, this uh, first bullet is that you don't lose your passive activity losses. Taxpayers didn't lose the passive activity losses, but they did lose the losses, lose claiming those deductions and losses in 2013 and 2014. So ultimately they would have to pay more tax in those years and, and the associated penalties and interest with that. And you know, whether they got the penalties, you know, that's maybe something we could talk about in another video as well. Secondly, taxpayers did not qualify as real estate professionals. And so they didn't qualify because they didn't meet the test that we just spent a couple minutes talking about. They didn't meet over half the business, half of the personal service um, test. They didn't spend over half of their time, personal service time in the business. They also didn't meet the 750 hour test. And then finally, they did not elect 469C7A aggregation election. So these tests needed to be measured on each property. And, and the estimate time logs that were allowed, the ones that we just saw, um, they were allowed and the court even noted that they were, they were excessive. The court even said these appeared excessive in most instances of what they were trying to estimate. And even if we allowed it, taxpayers did not qualify. So if we just skip back really quick to the time log, maybe this starts to make sense. If we can see Ms. Sezanov and Mr. Sezanov, we look at their total hours in 2013 and 2014. Now that we know what the tests are and we can kind of evaluate them, um, this obviously wasn't gonna wasn't gonna pass, right? If we're if Mr. and Mrs. Sezanov are saying in 2013 that they spent um, you know 400 hours each um, getting these properties uh, up and running. That almost looks like we could pass the material participation test of 500 hours with the spousal loophole. However, remember we talked about the material particip or we talked about the real estate professional test where you actually needed to measure these each separately. Each spouse needed to be measured separately and they needed to hit 750 hours. So obviously th this is not gonna fly. And then you look at 2014, they're not even close. 2014, they're a combined 106 hours and change. Like they're not even close to being material, or they're not even yeah close to being material participation at 500 hours. They're not even close to hitting real estate professional at 750 hours. So that's it for this video. I hope you learned a thing or two about being a real estate professional through the eyes of tax laws. Um, a couple of my closing thoughts here. This is an extremely top common topic. I come across this a lot in my practice. Uh, clients talk to me a lot about this. They want to know why on their tax returns that they are not allowed to claim their losses that they spent all this money on on their rental property, you know, the repairs, um, maybe a lawsuit, you know, trying to, uh, in this case, trying to um, um, secure claim to the boat slip. You know, why are they not allowed to, they have had to pay the money, why are they not allowed to take the losses? Um, you know, I, I, I talk about this a lot with clients. Um, another another uh, closing thought is the. I feel the IRS requirements of the level of record keeping is, is extremely generous. We saw the level of record keeping that was allowed. Um, it was effectively taxpayers scratching up what they thought could be their their time that they put in, and that was what was taken by the court. And also, and what I've seen in my practice as well is the IRS is actually allowing that. The they would um, even under audit the taxpayers are allowed to submit estimates of their time and it's uh, it's cited in this case as um, uh, it's cited in this case from um, another ruling or another memo I believe 
you know, estimates are required through any reasonable method. And the reasonable method is is pretty wide open. So I thought I thought this was a really good ki case to kind of exemplify that and it kind of it reflects what I've experienced in my practice as well. Um, so something that I always need to remind clients is to not forget the, the half personal um, service test because everyone's taking 750 hours. Oh yeah, I, I, I work 750 hours because that's almost like a, it's almost like a part-time job if you're a working professional like myself, you know, 2,000 hours, you know, an extra 750 hours, you know, that's, that's maybe working, um, you know, every weekend and maybe a couple, couple um, late nights, you know, you could probably c come up with that. But then everyone forgets that the threshold actually goes a little bit higher than that. Now you have to, you have to prove 1,001 hours or so, or if, you know, in, this, in the accounting industry, if you work overtime, if you're working 2,400 hours, let's say, or you're, you're an attorney, and now you have to prove that you worked 1,201 hours on real estate, and it kind of gets a little goofy after that. So um, you, don't, you really don't want to forget the half personal service test. Another closing thought, passive activity losses are not lost, they're just suspended. So you don't lose them, they're not gone. Um, you get to offset against personal income, or uh, sorry, against future passive income, or, or, this is the big kicker, if and when you ever sell the property, they unlock for that year, and you're allowed to take them all at once. So that's kind of the, the roundabout way where you don't actually lose them, it's just taken in a future year. And so you still want to claim them. You still want to have records for them. You still want to um, report them on your tax return. Like you still will get the benefit of it. It's just not going to be this year. Or it'll be when you sell the property, if ever, or when you start making passive income. You know, maybe when the when the property starts to become profitable, then you get to start offsetting that profit. Um, and my final closing thought is: please comment, leave me your thoughts. This is my first video. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this, what, what the next topic you might want to hear, and um, you, can, you can email me at talkingtaxwithalex at gmail.com. Thank you very much for, for watching this video and sticking this far. Um, I'll see you next time. Bye.